Welcome everyone to Beyond Surviving, the safe space for survivors of childhood sexual abuse to receive support, resources, and share their stories. Beyond Surviving is about freedom, healing, connection, and even laughter and fun. Most importantly, it's about letting go of the pain of abuse and finally moving on. I'm Rachel Grant. For those of you who don't yet know me, I've been a sexual abuse recovery coach since 2007 and I'm the author of Beyond Surviving, The Final Stage of Recovery from Sexual Abuse. You can learn more about me and the Beyond Surviving program at rachelgrantcoaching.com. Now, today, folks, I'm so excited to have here with me my guest, Kevin McNeil, who's going to be sharing with us how he overcame trauma and moved on to become a speaker, a prolific author. Y'all, he has six books and is working on his seventh and a really powerful advocate in his communities. So Kevin McNeil comes from a story that we are all very familiar with of sexual assault. Also, though, Kevin was kidnapped at the age of 12, and that was, you know, where he experienced this assault. So he understands intimately what it's like to be a victim, but more importantly, he knows what it takes to move beyond that point. He is a 20-year police veteran. Holy cow. <laughs> he has also worked as a special victims unit detective. Did you all hear the dun-dun of like law and order? I totally did when I read that the first time. Oh my gosh. So he did that for 12 years, really investigating child abuse crimes, which I can only imagine what he saw, what he witnessed um, in that role. And he made the decision ultimately to re retire from law enforcement, and then he decided to use his extensive background and insight to educate others on the effects of abuse. Another thing that Kevin's up to that's really exciting and interesting is that he's helping businesses and organizations create a healthy work culture. His workshops demonstrate how not understanding the effects of trauma can hinder an employee's work performance and productivity. He emphasizes people are a company's greatest asset and how they're treated will determine the success of the company. So if you are working in a, in a place that is not trauma informed and you would like that to change, if you're the owner of a business or an organization and you know that that is a part of your philosophy and you want your company culture to be such a place that people are safe um, who have experienced trauma, then definitely get in touch with Kevin. Oh my goodness, Kevin, thank you so much for being here. I am so looking forward to my conversation with you today. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. I feel honored to be a guest of yours and to be speaking with your listeners. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So one place that we always like to start is just the general, how did you get here kind yeah. of question. And, um, and I, you know, you've had such an extensive you know, journey, so many different yeah. places and spaces that you've explored. Um, and to now be here really in this role of advocate and speaker and writer, what are the things that you'd like people to most know about the journey that led you here? Yeah, the journey was, was, was hard and difficult, uh, but it was worth it. It was, it was something that, uh, that took time. It's a journey that I'm still on. Uh, I, I believe in uh, Hill ing i n g rather than healed e d mm -hmm. i believe it's always a process and it had to be intentional about it but it helped i had help along the way there were some guideposts and some mentors and some people who helped me along the way and it was community i couldn't heal in isolation i needed to heal in community that's why i'm so excited that you have this community uh beyond surviving because it's so necessary and it's so uh vital to survivors like me continuing this journey in healing beyond the actual abuse itself Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. you know, when we are, are faced with adversity, I mean, this is one of the things that I think we want to dig into today is this <laughs> idea and this concept of adversity. Yeah. And um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about some of the things that you faced. I mentioned a few of the pieces. Yeah. I'm sure our listeners are curious to hear a little bit more about that experience and, and how that went down and, and how that resolved for you. Yeah, sure. Uh, as a young boy, there was many things that I dealt with. One was not knowing my father. I had a speech impediment, so I was always bullied. And so I suffered bullying uh, through my younger years, and I was a very shy kid. And uh, one day I was visiting a friend's house. 
I was lifting weights with him. And uh, the reason I was lifting weights, I thought if I got bigger and had muscles and was intimidating, yeah. kids wouldn't make fun of me as much. And so one day I, I lost track of time and it had gotten dark. And I remember my mother telling me to get home before it got dark. That was my curse for you. And I started walking home by myself, a 12 year old little boy. And I decided to take a shortcut because I wanted to cut some time off my journey. And when I took the shortcut, I went behind a high school and some railroad tracks and appeared out of nowhere, a man, an adult male, uh, he dragged me underneath a set of bleachers uh, and he basically raped me. And once he was done raping me and making me doing some God awful things, he, he got on top of me and began to strangle me and tried to kill me. Mm -hmm. um, but I knew I didn't want to leave the earth that way. I didn't want to have my mom, my mother worrying about me. And so I fought this man, imagine a 12 year old little boy fighting this grown man. And I was able to break away from him and run across the football field. I ran uh, away from those bleachers across the football field, ran into the street. Cars were beginning to swirl left and right, but nobody stopped. Um, so I walked home and I, when I got home, I had on no shirt, no shoes, you know, blood and, you know, things in my jeans. And my mom saw me and she asked me what happened. I couldn't dare tell my mom that I lost my virginity to a man I never knew. Uh, some of the awful things that had happened to me. I was already bullied, so I didn't want to add additional trauma to what I was going through. So I lied to my mother and told I was robbed. Uh, and she begged me to call the police and she mm -hmm. wanted to call the police. I begged her not to. I was under the fear and impression that the police were called, they would have got the truth out of me. And I didn't want that. Um, and so ironically, I had to go to high school at that same high school the very you know next year. And uh, ironically, I walked down on that same football field uh, and I asked the coach, could I play football for them? Because I wanted to hide behind uh, a, a mask or a uniform. Mm -hmm. I figured if I was on the football team, nobody would see me and I would become part of something that, that people would kind of admire and you know, look up to. And so I joined the football team and, and ironically, my whole life has been the same way. You know, I joined the football team, left the football team, joined the military, left the military, became a police officer. And uh, so I spent the first half of my life dealing with my trauma by hiding, hiding behind uniforms and masks. Thank you for that. Yeah. As I hear about this, this experience in this moment, it, I'm present to a couple of things. One is how trauma regardless of context, always catches us by surprise. Yeah. There isn't a warning. And here is this most innocent of acts. You know, you're just trying to hustle, boy. I remember those days. Get in before the streetlights <laughs> come on. You know, yeah. like, I don't want to catch a whooping. I don't want to like be yeah. in trouble. I won't get exactly. grabbed. It's like, oh, if I just go this way, you know, and here yeah. you are just out in the world and this, you know, human being um, takes advantage of that, assaults yeah. you, harms you in this very severe way. Yeah. yeah. And as a kid, you never know. I mean, you think the world is a safe place, you right. know, particularly when it comes to adults. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I, I experienced bullying from other kids and my peers, but I didn't think an adult would do such harm to me, particularly in that way. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was a big surprise. Thank you. Another part of your story that I just so relate to is the, the pretending and the hiding. Yeah. You know, and um, I experienced that actually on the other side of um, my mom finding out about the abuse. So even though it was kind of out there, I still felt that sense of, I need to hide this. And I yeah. need, I just want to pretend that everything's okay. Yeah. And I just want to go on. And, and I can really relate to like the masks and the facades. Like we all find, like mine was kind of like the drama girl <laughs> and, you know, the A plus student and, you know, mm. these different things, you yeah. know, take on these personas and not that they aren't in some ways good and like your service was not m meaningful yeah. thank you for yeah. your service by the way thank you thank you, thank you. The, the police force mm -hmm. um but gosh yeah it, ca it causes us to stay hidden um, yeah who we really are and that yeah. really catches up with us yeah and the interesting thing about it was as a kid i didn't know that that is what i was doing uh, right. i was simply trying to mask the pain and then as a result of that, I've developed coping mechanisms to deal with my trauma. And I didn't know that's what I was doing, you know, drinking heavily, becoming promiscuous, you know, uh, becoming addicted to sex and things like that. And so I was using those destructive methods. As you said, some people use constructive methods in which they actually become uh, good grades. They dwell in their work. They become very, you know, 
And so part of mine was I had, I had both and. I had the part of my life where I was living as an upstanding soldier, police officer, but the other part of my had, uh, half of my life going home, uh, drinking myself uh, to mm-hmm. sleep and being addicted to sex. So I had a double life yeah. at some point. Oh my gosh, ditto. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Totally, totally. Yeah. Like on one hand, doing just fine in some areas and in other places, like just being a hot mess. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and like this is not working. Yeah. And I think that is like, that's the duality that so many of us are trying to make sense of. Mm, in this journey yeah. of feeling like yeah. in these kind of two selves and these two parts of who we are and, and all of that. And and I know for me, I really hit a moment in my journey where I, I hit this moment where I, I couldn't pretend anymore. Yeah. I had to face it. I had to deal with it. And I, I'm wondering if you had a moment like that too. And, and yeah. if so, what was it? Yeah, that moment for me was as a police officer, you know, people used to ask me all the time, what was the most difficult thing for me? What was my greatest fear? Was it being shot, killed in the line of duty? And I had to think about it, right? And so when I really thought about it, my greatest fear was going home at the end of the night and looking at that guy in the mirror who I did not like. And there were times where I would drink myself uh, to a slumber and I would actually have to hide my gun before I poured a, a glass of alcohol, hide my gun in the closet because I was having suicidal thoughts. The hope was by the time I walked to the closet, I would think about my mom and my family and not mm-hmm. do such a thing to myself and the pain that would cause them. But that moment came for me when I got called up to be a special victim detective. I never knew what that was. Uh, in uh, 2006 or 2008, I had an encounter where I got in a high speed chase. I was a police officer with some armed guys and I was outnumbered and they pulled guns on me and I had to use my service weapon to uh, defend my life and uh, end up shooting one of the guys, but I almost died during that encounter. And it was then that I decided to give up being a police officer. But a friend of mine talked me into becoming a detective. And once I became a special victim detective, it all made sense to me. I started putting the, 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 the puzzle together. You know, as a police officer, I was seeing adults kill each other, do harm to each other. I saw so much pain in the world. But then when I became a detective investigating child abuse crimes, I saw how children were suffering from trauma. And if they didn't get help or intervention, some of the children that were my victims were later becoming suspects in other crimes in the police department. And so I began to put this together. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. And so mm-hmm. some of the behaviors parents were telling me they were seeing and witnessing as their child being a, being a victim yeah. of abuse. I was able to identify with and say, wait a minute, I had some of those same issues and same challenges. And so that caused me to learn more about trauma. So it came when I was able to sit down and, and, and watch a forensic interview of a little child tell their story. And I watched after they tell the, after the little boy told him, and ironically it was a little boy. Mm-hmm. And I watched after this little boy tell his story, how alive he became. He walked into the office sad with his shoulders slumped down you know, his head hung low. But when he got done telling his story, he just walked out of there like a a whole weight had been lifted. And it was like, wow, you know, that's what I need to do. And so it was like, as I was listening to this little boy, the little boy in me uh, began to weep and was hoping that someone would be, I would be courageous enough to allow him to tell his story. So that was that moment for me. Shit, Kevin. <laughs> okay, you weren't supposed to be coming up in here getting me all teary-eyed. Oh, sorry I, about that. I got my mascara going. <laughs> Man, like that, I can see that. I can see that moment. Yeah. I can see that little boy. I can see you seeing yourself in that yeah. little boy. Mm-hmm. And in that moment of courage of this little guy, Yeah. it releasing you. Yeah. And helping yeah. you find your voice and your courage yeah. to feel yeah. your own trauma. Yeah, and the journey that is so amazing is that I didn't plan it, right? It was right. like divine power and God led yes. me to this space where I needed to see that in order to be, have the courage enough to let my little boy speak for me because he was already speaking, but he was throwing tension tantrums Woo. in the way that he was he was making elves all of a sudden at school. He was skipping class. He went from a straight A student to a straight C student, D mm-hmm. student, and started fighting. You know, Before my incident, people were bullying me and I would take it. But after my incident, I started lashing out, you know, I started fighting, started getting in trouble. But people thought I was a bad kid. But that was that little boy, you know, trying to trying to communicate to the world that, hey, I'm not well. And so that little boy saved my life that day. You know, this brings to mind a question for me, which is, you know, I think that we miss the signals. We miss the signs that we often, um, you know, categorize. 
um, aggressive behavior, particularly in boys. Yeah. As first of all, boys being boys, which there's so much problem with that, but yeah, also just like, oh, he's a bad kid, you know, yeah. oh, he's difficult, he's da 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 da. And like, people don't take the time to really check in and think. Yeah. Um, I think boys get overlooked so often that the signs don't get picked up. Yeah. Right? Would you agree with that from your own experience and, and maybe what you've seen in the field too? Yeah, I would agree with that because I, that's part of my work now as an advocate is to show how a lot of the crime and violence in our community stems from the unresolved trauma and that we are communicating and listening spirits. That's who we are as, as people, right? And so if you're not able to communicate and communicate to someone who can listen to your pain, you find alternative methods to actually express that pain. And a lot of them come in a coping mechanism. And so I always tell people when you judge, you can't hear. Judge makes you deaf. Because when you judge someone, you can't listen to that pain because you're too busy judging their behavior. And so that's what happens oftentimes is that we see someone addicted to drugs. We see someone struggling with alcohol. We see someone being promiscuous. We see someone lashing out and we say, oh, that person is, is bad. We look at what they're doing, but we don't ask why they're doing it. Right. And, and so we need to create spaces where we can become listening uh, spirits so we can hear the pain that people are carrying in their own spirits. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, I second that. I third that. Yeah. <laughs> I fourth that. I mean, like, my gosh, it's so yeah. profound what you just said there, that when yeah. we judge, when we judge another person and how they are showing up in the world, we are forgetting our humanity. We are yeah. forgetting to ask, but why? Yeah. People don't just lash out. People don't just turn violent. People don't just, you know, act a fool. It's there's something underneath all of that that's driving. Yeah. And yeah. So, and often to people, anger is unexpressed pain. So a lot of time for men, mm -hmm. men feel like it's okay to express anger, but not uh, a vulnerability. And yeah. a lot of times what you see is men, yeah. we lash out because to be vulnerable makes us even more susceptible to being judged and being called weak. And that's one of the greatest struggles I had as a young person. I can't tell my story. They're going to be like, why didn't you fight? Even though I was 12 and he was an adult, uh, people just see that as, man, I would have fought. I would have fought. You know, there's no way a man is doing that to me. And so trauma is, is something that you cannot see. But if you learn to listen, you can hear trauma every day. All you have to do is turn on the news. You hear it. No doubt. So you make this decision. It's time. Yeah. And we already know just from what we've just been talking about, all of the barriers that are there um, for survivors of sexual trauma, period. But then the extra barriers that are there for boys to come yeah. forward to speak about their experience. And now, yeah. how old were you when you kind of made this shift and you said, okay. Man, I, was I, in my, I was in my 40s. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was in my 40s. And, and, and again, it wasn't voluntary. Like even after I saw that little boy, I went to therapy. That's that's that began mm -hmm. to change, and that's where I started talking about this journey. It was yeah. a process of healing, and not just one moment. Uh, I went to therapy, and uh, actually, one time I was in the office as a detective, and someone from the district attorney's office called. Uh, they had but double booked a training, and they had no one from the district attorney's office to go down and teach, and so um, they asked me what I do. It at first I was reluctant because I'd never taught anybody. And so yeah. I didn't know what I was going to do or say. And so I said, you know what, I'd do it. And so the first thing that came to my mind was like, I've never shared my story. Maybe I can tell my story. And it was in a room full of nurses. And I was supposed to teach them how to gather evidence for sexual assault cases. And I told them my story. And when I was done, man, the, everybody in the room was crying. Oh, yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then people were coming up to me telling me that they were abused as children. And it was the first time that they disclosed. Mm. I was like, wow, you know, and I saw the power of telling and sharing the pain that I had experienced and letting it out. And I noticed how much better I felt about it. But that is not what made me feel the best. What made me feel the best is that for the first time, people who had held onto the same secrets were able to tell their stories. And so that is what turned the light on for me and say, you know what? I, I want to do this more often. I want to do it more frequently. <laughs> right? It's like a bug you catch. You're like, okay, yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. Like, yeah, it really can feel like that. And when exactly. you get that kind of clarity and yeah. you absolutely, you know, this is one of the reasons why I love having this podcast is to bring these stories like yours um, yeah. because it does encourage others to, to find their own voice and to yeah. come forward and to start that path 
to freedom. You know, I often tell my clients, you know, we cannot heal what we will not name. That's it. Yeah. 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 And that's the thing about trauma. Trauma, uh, it likes to remain hidden and then you can't mm -hmm. see it with the eyes. I tell people the eyes are great judges, but they're horrible listeners, right? <laughs> if you, yeah. Yeah. If you're going to listen, you have to listen with your heart. And to listen with your heart, you have to have compassion. Yeah. And oftentimes as victims, we build up this stone wall, particularly males. And all victims do this because we've been hurt so often. We've been hurt at the most uh, deep level. You know, someone steal your car, you can get a car back. Someone break in your house, you can get property back. You know, uh, mm -hmm. someone injure your body, you can heal from your body. But sexual assault is a deep not only physical, but spiritual, psychological, emotional injury that it, it destroys every parts of you and you become very fragmented. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot to put yourself back together or to remember yourself because you're so fragmented. And that's one of the things that has become my passion is to help people to remember themselves. Oh my goodness, beautiful. I wanna hear so much more about that and what you have found to be the ways in which we can really achieve that. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with more of that. For survivors of abuse, shame can be one of the most pervasive feelings we carry well after the abuse has ended. As a result of trauma, we come to believe that we are at fault or to blame for what's happened then this transforms into a deeply rooted way of being that impacts our sense of self. We come to believe that we are unlovable and then we find ourselves constantly in self-blame, shame, and in derogatory or negative thinking. In my Shake Off the Shame Masterclass, you will gain access to my proven process that will help you feel more confident and secure so you can put an end to taking care of everyone but you. You can identify the toxic shame-based beliefs that keep you trapped in a cycle of taking the blame for everything and how to overcome them, and learn practical, easy-to-use strategies for how to escape shame and finally love who you are. Go to rachelgrantcoaching.com slash shame dash class to download this MP3 masterclass today. Now back to our show. So Kevin, before our break, you were talking about this idea of remembering ourselves. Yeah. Coming back into wholeness. Yeah. And I'd love for you to talk with us a little bit about how did you achieve that? What was your path to okay. that place? Okay. I can do that. Yeah, I can do that. Definitely. What do you think is the first step? Like, what, do you, what did you do first? What was maybe the most meaningful or most important first step in that process? The first step was being able to share my story, uh, to be able to notice that I wasn't uh, a bad person, that something bad happened to me. Um, and I started educating myself about the effects of trauma. I think that was the most important step. Once I understood what trauma did to the brain, how the brain controls behavior, the different parts of the brain that are affected, my learning, my ability to focus, my ability to interact socially because the survival brain was very anxious, right? I couldn't really have any intimacy in my relationships because I was always worried about what people thought about me. Mm -hmm. So the education piece is what really helped me. When I started reading books, when I started looking into uh, uh, articles and how other abuse victims were healing, that was the beginning for me. Um, and that took a lot of, of courage to look beyond the veil and not just to see the act itself, that I was sick, I was mentally ill. And not, normally people don't attach mental illness to abuse. They, they don't see the connection, but there's a, there's a, there's a great connection to mental illness and, and, um, and abuse because abuse and trauma fragments the brain. The brain is made up of several different parts that must work in connection with one another for a person to be mentally healthy. Yeah, absolutely. And so when you're traumatized, you know, your prefrontal cortex, your planning brain, your focusing brain is not communicating with your survival brain, you know, that whole limbic system, yes. the whole part of yourself that wants to survive and always look at the world as a threatening place. So you're being very impulsive and you're not able to calm yourself down and say, wait a minute, you know, I can go to this game, this football game. There's no one hiding on the bleachers trying to attack me. Right. But you're always anxious. And then you got to deal with the health aspects of it. Um, 
you know, I was very uh, unhealthy physically because uh, I don't know if you're familiar with ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences yes. Study. Once I learned about that, that just really blew me away. And it scared me, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, that was the first learning and education. Oh, yeah. That's why you, people always hear me say, I quote Nelson Mandela when Mel Nelson Mandela says, education is the greatest tool that you can use to change the world. And I believe that. Yeah, I agree. You and me were like two peas in a pod, man, because the, yeah. <laughs> the moment that I started to understand the neuroscience of trauma, mm -hmm. everything changed for me. Everything. Yeah. I began yeah. to put those pieces together. Yeah. I began to understand like my brain, my system had been injured. Yep. And I really became hopeful that I could then heal that injury, right? Yeah. Like I can, there, I can repair, I can restore. And everything I was reading yeah. about the brain and the nervous system said that can happen. The yeah. brain resilience, yeah. right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So that understanding um, piece is so very critical. And so you've you've been doing this healing work. You've been on this journey. You've been tackling yourself, right? Looking yourself yeah. up there, um, yeah. and hopefully with more smiles these days <laughs> than you <used> do. <laughs> And life has really evolved and changed. And so now you're out in the world and speaking and writing and, and being an advocate. And I'm just so curious, like, what are you most surprised by in your life these days? Oh, man, what I'm most surprised by is that the, that the struggle never goes away. Mm -hmm. Right. So you can heal and you still have moments of 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 of, of insecurities, moments where you don't want to be vulnerable, moments where you're 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 falling backwards where you you're thinking wait a minute you're judgmental about yourself you make a mistake and you're very judgmental or you may still struggle with some of the things you use as coping mechanisms mm -hmm. and and so what i've learned what really surprised me is that you have to be intentional particularly as a victim of trauma and abuse you have to be particular into what you allow to come into your mind you have to be very intentional on how you treat yourself because yeah. one of the things that happens as a trauma victim you I tell people, you know, it's difficult to carry around a body that you feel like is no longer any good to you, mm -hmm. right? Because everywhere you go, there you are, right? So <laughs> you yeah. can't get rid of this. Not get so, away from yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. the trauma is there everywhere you go. And just like, you know, people who attend the AA meetings, they'll tell you, you know, yeah, they may have been clean, but the threat to relapse is always there. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very careful to make sure I guard my relationships with the people I surround myself with. Uh, but this, what surprised yeah. me is that the work that it takes to heal. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I, I grew up, you know, as a Baptist child, you know, in church. And, <laughs> you know, I had these images and the, these teachings where people just touch you and you was done, right? Right. Oh, my gosh. Yes, I remember. <laughs> It was like, okay, you know, uh -huh. you know, healed. Yeah, you healed, you're done, you know. Yeah. You know yeah. So all you have to do is just just wish it away. And it was like, okay. Yeah. Mm -mm. I understood about yeah. trauma. It's like, nah, that ain't that ain't how this works. So that became my passion to mm -hmm. take what I knew um and bring it out of the classrooms and bring it out of the courtrooms and bring it into people's living rooms. And that's what the 12 project was created. That's what it's all about. Yeah. It's in the public on the effects of abuse because those are the people who need to know it the most. I was going to conferences and I was listening to all this, this great information about trauma and I was like, wait a minute, why are we teaching the public this? Why are we teaching ministers and people who care for children, daycare workers, why are we not yes. making this a requirement to get a license to be a minister, a license to be a teacher, yes, Kevin. a license to be a police yes. officer, right? Why are we not making this a requirement? And I said, we have to stop pretending to care for our children. We have to actually do it. Mm -hmm. uh, Children, you know, I tell people, you know, my whole goal is, you know, you know, we had the civil rights movement, but I want to do the children's rights movement. I want to mm -hmm. make sure children are, are, are taken care of and they're protected. Yes. Wow. Yeah. So the 12 project is so fascinating. That's actually how I um, found you was okay. an article about that work that you were doing. And I just immediately was like, yep, got to talk to this guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> so y'all yeah. go over the 12 project.com and learn more um, about the work that Kevin's doing there. Certainly he's, you know, up for hire to come and do trainings and workshops and, and speak, and you're absolutely right. You know, people working with children should be trauma informed. 
They yes. should have this awareness. They should have this knowledge. It should be required. So I love that you're out there doing this work. Is there anything more you want to share about what you're up to um, at the 12 Project, things that you're working on right now that you're excited yeah. about? Yeah. Like I said, I'm trying to create a platform. I had a Patreon account right now where people can go and I just do motivational, inspirational, small talks, you know, for victims and people of trauma and people who know people who suffer from trauma. Uh, again, I want to be that person that I didn't have. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what that's about. And so that's what I'm currently working on, doing videos. I'm writing my new book. Uh, I switched over to fiction. I used to write a lot of nonfiction, but I found that people who picked up my nonfiction books were already, you know, kind of passionate about the subject. So now I do fictional books kind of help people read a story and within the story is embedded the truth about trauma and abuse and they go wow I never knew that yeah. and so I'm working on my new book A Cry From Heaven uh, which is my new fictional book I just released a book I think a year ago called God Child uh, Why Some Sense Systems Need to Be Broken mm -hmm. uh, that book is available right now on Amazon uh, it's a very uh, powerful book about human sex trafficking uh, in the, the system that doesn't understand how to interview and treat victims mm -hmm. so that book is a, a, a favorite of mine. Mm. Okay, I'm gonna put you on the spot in a big old way right now. Okay. Because okay. of your background in law enforcement and in the SVU department, mm -hmm. I mean, do you have hope that these systems can evolve, can change? I have so many clients right now, and of course, just people yeah. in my community who are going through trials and boy, that system just feels so broken. I mean, yeah. it, you know, it's another system that's not trauma informed. Yeah. And the ways that victims are treated in that process. And yeah, I'd love to just hear your perspective about that. Yeah, I think it's changing somewhat. Uh, I do a lot of trainings with police departments across the nation. Uh, they're reluctant to it. Police departments, they feel like they've done things the same way all the, all the time. They figure, figure it works. And it doesn't work. Uh, you can't train a detective that you teach to look for evidence with their eyes to look for a child who's been touched a year ago. You mm -hmm. know, I can see a dead body, right? I know something happened to that person. I just got to prove who did it, right? But how do you prove a, a seven-year-old who comes forward and that, that someone's been touching them inappropriately at night, right? And so mm -hmm. it, it, you can't see that. And so often, we have to train differently than other detectives. We have to know uh, more information about trauma. We have to know about behavior issues that trauma causes. We have to be able to articulate this and bring it into the courtrooms as evidence. Mm -hmm. And so I think if the system is going to change, it has to be a, 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 a overhaul. We have to do it with the prosecutors. We have to do it with the child advocates. We have to do it with the social workers. We have to do it with the teachers. We have to do it with everybody. So 10 years from now, that the general public would know about trauma. So when they're sitting in a jury box and they hear a detective or a social worker talk about this child lashing out at school and going from a straight A student to a straight F student or a straight F student to a straight A student, the same behaviors that the defense attorney uses to defend the suspect can now become tools that can use to explain why the child is acting the way they act. And yeah. so I think it's gonna be a, a, a long time, but I think it can happen, okay. but I think it needs to be brought to the attention of law enforcement mm -hmm. more often. And I think that's the difficulty part is to get those in the higher uh, positions to understand that we can't wait to, to train about trauma. And also mm -hmm. we need to get the officers training about vicar vicarious trauma. Yeah, you know? right. Wow, you just blew my mind. I mean, so much of that was, was very fascinating. But what you said about can we get the people in the jury box to yeah. be trauma informed? Holy yeah. shit. Like yeah. that is an angle and that is a perspective yeah. that yeah. I've never heard before. Yeah. Like we get the language of trauma and trauma awareness out there in just in the world so that it's yeah. commonplace. It's just as common as, you know, we think about our ABCs, that yeah. kind of thing. Then every person sitting in that jur jury box is going to be less easily swayed or persuaded because they're exactly. going to have that foundation. Come yeah. on, Kevin. Yeah. Because, <laughs> World changer. Yeah. I see you. Yes. <laughs> and you think about it. We don't live in a victim friendly culture. The, the, think about this. You know, we don't ask the, the gunshot victim where you shot. Right. right. We don't we don't ask the burglar victim, are you sure your home was broken into? Right. But when it comes to the abuse victim, we ask them, Are you sure? Are you sure? Why do we do yeah. that? Oh, right. it's so wrong. Yeah. And so when it comes to abuse victims, we give the suspect the benefit of the doubt, but we yeah. doubt the victim. And we make the victim prove their own abuse. Now think about this, when it comes to a child, think about this, we hold children responsible to stop their own abuse. 
because until a child says something, the abuse continues. It keeps going. Right? Yeah. So we have to train adults to notice things before the child even says anything. Yeah. And yeah. so we have to teach, we got to actually, there are actually organizations and people out there that actually try to discredit victims, try to prove false memory and exactly. all these other things. Yes. And so yeah. we have to become a culture that believes the victim. Yeah. You have to believe the victim 100% of the time. There's no 90 to 80 and people give me, but what if the victim's being untruthful? Let your investigation prove it. Don't go into that with that, that presumption or that assumption that the victim could be lying. And for most investigators, I've done it. I'm guilty of it. Mm-hmm. We go in questioning the victim. In, in essence, what we're doing, we're victim blaming. Why didn't you tell? Yeah. You know, what took you so long? Why did your story change? Well, if you don't understand trauma, you don't understand the fragmentation of the brain and the memory system, the hippocampus and how the, the person remembers based on how they feel safe and comfortable with the person who's asking the questions. That's right. right? So as a law enforcement officer, I was re-traumatizing my victims and didn't even know it. Mm. Man, thank you for owning that. And yeah. thank you for knowing better, doing better. And, yes. you know, and that's exactly it. Like, it's not like there wasn't like there was a system in place that was supporting you in knowing what to do. And how to yeah. avoid that and exactly why we need reform and change. Yeah. And that's why I resigned because I knew I couldn't change the system it. within. Yes. In 2017, that's I walked enough. away and said, let me try it on the other yeah. side. Maybe yeah. they'll listen. Wow. Well, you know, again, I'm just so glad that you're out there in the world. I also want to take a moment to just really honor you as a male mm-hmm. survivor, um, because I know that our world is changing, but it's yeah. still not the easiest thing. You know, women, we have a little bit more space these days to come forward and to speak, but we're not quite there, I think, for men. And so, you know, anytime a male survivor comes forward, I just am doubly grateful because mm-hmm. I know the men listening to this podcast will be um, just edified and supported by your story and by you coming yeah. forward as a man. Well, so thank, thank you, you so much for that. And thank, thank you. you for being a badass. Oh my <laughs> gosh, Kevin. <laughs> like, thank you so much. This is the thing that just like inspires me so much. And I see it again thank and you. again in those of us who've experienced really terrible, shitty, unimaginable things that we yeah. become powerful. Yeah. Right? And man, and you are using your gifts and your power and all that you've learned through those experiences to really make some big changes in this world. And so as we start to, I really want to talk to you for like another three hours. (laughs) I have so many questions. I have so many questions. (laughs) Um, But alas, um, to be respectful of your time. um, (laughs) What would be your final thoughts for our listeners tonight? I would say to to know that there's hope. There's hope in the recovery. There's hope in your resiliency. You're stronger than what you think you are. Uh, There's a way to really, really connect with yourself, the part of you that was hurt. And connect with a community, someone, a people who can listen to you without trying to fix you, without trying to tell you something is wrong with you. I would tell your listeners that they're going to be okay they're going to be okay in that fact that they feel the pain that they're feeling. That's okay. That's normal. But there's a way through the pain. And once you get through the pain, you can become even more resilient and you can become a light to the world for those around you. An example of surviving, but not only surviving, thriving. And that is my hope for, for every survivor is that they can thrive and they can live their best lives despite what had happened to them. Yeah, man, me too. Me too. Mm -hmm. Kevin, it has been such a joy to connect with you you today. Thank you so much for being my guest. And thank you you everyone for joining us and tuning in. Um, Be sure to pop over to the12project.com, support what Kevin is doing, get involved, um, and also follow him on Instagram, Kevin underscore McNeil. Um, And you can also pop over to rachelgrantcoaching.com to learn more about sexual abuse recovery coaching and check out the other resources that are available there. Please be sure to subscribe to the podcast, follow us, leave us a comment, and then come back next time because we have so much more to share. And until then, take good care of you.